Yeah, so Quentin and I have been uh, tasked with uh, outlining uh, the questions and challenges for this year's CIDR theme. This is unfortunate. Um, yeah. Well, it disappears into a rat's nest of ports under here. Okay, whew, yeah. <laughs> okay, so first, welcome to paradise. Uh, Santa Barbara is a beautiful place to be um, pretty much any time of the year, uh, and it's a great place to think about the sorts of problems uh, that we're going to be dealing with for the next couple of weeks. So this is a really unique program, and um, there's a number of different fields that can converge and ponder the, the big inverse problem that the Earth's interior is. And seismologists, mineral physicists, geochemists, and genomicists can really get together and use their different constraints, the constraints that they have available to each of them, to, to, uh, to build a picture of the Earth's interior. Um, we have the next two weeks to identify the most important themes, uh, the most important outstanding questions uh, that remain um, for really building an understanding for how uh, the Earth's interior operates. And uh, I, I really want to emphasize that uh, we should all really make an effort to discuss the problems uh, that the speakers are proposing and to ask a lot of questions and to really engage and to use the coffee breaks to share ideas and follow up on ideas and build common interests. Because you know, just for the students, uh, this is really an opportunity uh, to define where the field is right now. So I was a student, uh, participant in 2006. This is 10 years later, so I'm now on the other side of the room talking to the students. And if the students look around and look at the other students around you, and I can pretty much guarantee that you guys will be seeing each other for the next 30 years. Um, it really is a group of the movers and shakers in this field. This isn't just a little workshop. This is a workshop where we're actually defining where the field goes. This is a wonderful opportunity. And as we define the important questions, um, in the next two weeks we can then uh, use these new questions we've identified to, uh, to pursue some research projects in weeks three and four. And so uh, identify the sorts of people you work well with, that share common interests, uh, but try to spread the interests across a number of different fields. It's important to pair geochemists and geodynamicists and seismologists to really approach uh, these deep earth problems with an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. So just starting out, I think we can all agree, this is a dynamic Earth. It's a number of tectonic plates that uh, comprise the Earth's surface, and they're all moving about. And uh, the big question is, is what happens when we look at the Earth in 3D, when we start to peer inside the Earth? We have a really dynamic Earth interior. And Quentin promised me a visceral reaction if I showed this, so I'm not going to show it. Quentin, thank you for that. <laughs> so we have a virtually inaccessible interior. And I'm always humbled by the fact, and this important, uh, unfortunately this slide got cut off, that the deepest we've ever actually directly probed the Earth's interior uh, was on the Kola Peninsula. The Soviets drilled down 12.3 kilometers, so just eight miles. And that is the deepest the humans have ever directly probed the Earth's interior. Everything else that we have, all the other information we have for the Earth's interior, uh, is um, based on indirect observation. 
The Earth's interior is an extremely challenging inverse problem. We have constraints from the various fields that are uh, represented in this room, from the seismologists, the geochemists, though maybe the geochemists don't provide many constraints. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Mineral physics, uh, petrology, uh, and geodynamics. So this is the previous approach. I was trying to think, how do I approach this presentation? So my counterpart, two years ago, spent an hour systematically going through each of these questions um, in two slides. And I thought that maybe I wouldn't do a great job approaching it this way. So I identified a few key problems. A lot of these problems are very important, uh, but I wanted to focus on just a few key problems. And Quentin and I sort of divvied up some of the problems that we saw as being important. And we're not covering all the problems, uh, but just ones that are food for thought, seed problems, and many other problems are going to be developed by other speakers over the next couple of weeks. So the deep earth. What do we really know? The truth is about this slide is it's a summary of what I think we don't know very well yet, which are some of the most important parameters for the Earth's interior. For example, there's a big debate raging right now about what the Earth's bulk composition is. We don't know the Earth's bulk composition very well. Some people think we do. Other people think we don't. And I'll circle back to this uh, towards the end. But, for example, if we don't know the Earth's bulk composition, we don't know the uranium, thorium, potassium budgets, therefore we don't know the radiogenic heat production for the planet. So we don't know the URI number. Okay, so this is important. The viscosity of the Earth's interior. It's very much a function of the water content. Okay, so we need to have a better constraint on water content for the Earth's interior. Uh, this is a challenging problem. Uh, the distribution of compositional heterogeneities within the Earth. Geochemists and seismologists both agree that the Earth's interior is heterogeneous. We just don't know what the compositions of these heterogeneities are or what sorts of length scales they're distributed over. And then the variations and key parameters with depth. If we don't know the composition of the planet, then it becomes very difficult to make uh, to make clear statements about the difference in upper versus lower mantle composition. What is the composition of the lower mantle? Is it different from the upper mantle? Or uh, temperature gradients as we go from the surface to depth. What is the core mantle boundary temperature gradient? What is the lower, the deepest uh, lower mantle temperature profile? What's the viscosity of the lower mantle? All outstanding questions. Are there melts at both the top and the bottom of the mantle? I know there are people in the audience, some who believe that the lower mantle has melt, and others who don't. So this is a really important problem. And of course, the age and evolution of mantle domains, something that's near and dear to my heart. There are some mantle domains we now know have fingerprints from the early Hadean that have been preserved in the convecting mantle for over four and a half billion years and sampled by modern-day volcanism. How on earth, how in earth, did these heterogeneities persist and survive for four and a half billion years in a chaotic mantle? Yeah. Thanks. And you started with a, a kind of a nice cartoon of plate tectonics at the surface. And, um, and then, you know, there's this list of questions. But I'm kind of curious. If, if plate tectonics at the surface kind of governs the whole interior flow and it's all driven by what happens at the surface, do some of those questions become less important? I don't know if... I don't know if plate tectonics drives what goes on at depth or what goes on at depth drives plate tectonics. I mean, probably a bit of both. Exactly. And so if... if I, I didn't mean to imply that plate tectonics is driving everything. No, uh, and so I was, I was asking that specifically to kind of to, to ask, you know, in your list of questions, are some of them more important if we have the deep interior driving versus the surface driving? or if there's a way to kind of distinguish between the, those questions. So, so if the interior is driving, do some of those questions not matter as much? If the surface is driving, are some of the other questions less important? I think that they all continue to be important, regardless of it's, whether it's top-down or bottom-up. Yeah? Thank you. 
Okay, so when we peer into the Earth's interior, when seismologists peer into the Earth's interior, the most salient feature that's observed are these large, low shear wave velocity provinces. This extremely annoying acronym that we can attribute to a gentleman up front here. <laughs> I guess there's a movement afoot to remove at least one of these letters. Um, still not very helpful. Don't blame the geochemists for complicated acronyms. We like to keep it to three or four letters. Um, so seismic tomography reveals uh, two large low velocity regions in the, in the lowermost mantle, one centered underneath the Atlantic and the other uh, in Africa and the other underneath the uh, South Pacific. These are salient features observed, but we don't really know what they're made out of. One common hypothesis is that these are simply uh, primitive reservoirs in the deep Earth, so remnants of a deep magma ocean that crystallized uh, in the early Earth history. And there are a couple of different models out right now, uh, the Labrosse model and the Lee et al. model. Um, and the Lee et al. model is interesting. It argues that uh, the liquids of a, a magma ocean that uh, is differentiating, the liquids would be denser than the solids and would settle uh, into the deep Earth so that the... the um, the deep earth could be comprised of, of these large shear wave velocity provinces could be comprised of uh, uh, melts, uh, the deepest melt differentiates of a magma ocean. Alternatively, uh, the, the large low shear wave velocity provinces are simply slab graveyards. So the accumulated mass of subducted slabs over geologic time. And then, of course, there's the hybrid model that argues that the, these provinces are a combination of both primitive and recycled slab material. Boy, would we like to have resolution on this issue. So these large low shear wave velocity provinces, we're, we're left with more questions than answers. Uh, are they hotter than the ambient mantle? Are they chemically anomalous? Or are they both? Are they both chemically anomalous and hotter? Are they stationary? Do they move around? This is a huge debate right now. Is uh, Shiji here yet? OK. So Shiji argues that they're moving around. Tron Torsvik argues that they're stationary for long periods of time. We'd like to have resolution on this. Are they primordial? Are they slab graveyards? Are they growing? So this is one possibility. If they, if they are composed primarily of, of subducted slabs, then it would seem that they should be growing over time as more recycled uh, material enters the mantle. And do they host pockets of melt? And if they do host pockets of melt, are those pockets of melt focused on the ultra-low velocity zones, or do the large little shear wave velocity provinces host some small fraction of melt distributed over the entire province? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I guess uh, I just want to point out for the benefit of for the benefit of the students, uh, that you're using shorthand here that they might find confusing. Okay. When you say, are they slab graveyards, I think it's important to point out that the uh, blue regions in these maps that you're showing are where, uh, based on kind of geographic coincidence and based on tracing structures from the surface down to depth, you're most likely to actually have the cold oceanic lithosphere so if there's a slab graveyard, that's what we're talking about. I think when people invoke, uh, or this is probably what you're referring to, is perhaps ancient subducted crust, which got separated from those slabs, perhaps accumulating in the, uh, to form what we might, might soon be calling slurps. <laughs> <laughs> for we low rigidity provinces. And then S is for seismic. Have you run that by Dr. Garnero yet? Uh, yeah, in fact, <laughs> we, we came up with it together. So. OK. All right. Yes, thank you. So this is what Veg just did is really important. Uh, we all have a tendency to slip into our shorthand and the vagaries of our own fields. So please, please, don't be afraid to stop the speaker and say, back up, simplify. This is really important. So a, a great review paper just came out in the last couple of weeks. Uh, uh, Garnero, McNamara, and Shim 
kind of outlining really uh, what we know, but more what we don't know about these large low shear wave velocity provinces. This is really annoying because my slides have been cut off at the bottom. Right? Okay, bizarre. Um, uh, for example, are these large low shear wave velocity provinces, are they packets of plumes at the base of the mantle? Or are these large regions that have positive buoyancy? Or are they stable features at the base of the mantle uh, off of which plumes form an upwell? Or are they metastable piles with uh, internal dynamics? All questions. These, uh, again, the most salient objects in the deep mantle and we know very little about them. And then there's this uh, interesting possibility that if plumes form, mantle plumes, buoyantly upwelling mantle plumes form at the edges of these, these provinces, then there exists the possibility that one portion of the plume, well, the portion of the plume facing the province will entrain material from the province, but the portion of the plume facing away from the province will not. And if this is preserved in the upwelling plume conduit, then you know, there's the possibility of generating the bilateral asymmetry that we see in hotspots. And a famous example is at Hawaii, where we have not one chain of age progressive volcanoes, but actually two parallel chains of volcanoes. Two parallel chains of volcanoes that, identified with the red and blue lines, separate really nicely isotopically. And we still don't know why. And there was an interesting hypothesis put out by Weiss et al. in 2013, arguing that this bilateral asymmetry could be due to the fact that Hawaii is displaced just to the north side of the large low shear wave velocity provinces, and therefore, in this sort of model, the south side of the Hawaiian plume should then be in training the province material. And if this is preserved in the plume conduit, then the south side chain in the hot spot should be chi chemically enriched, because we think these provinces are enriched for various reasons I'll get to in a second. And this is what we see. So I don't know if this is the case. It's an interesting hypothesis. And um, <coughs> There have been efforts made now for almost 20 years uh, trying to relate uh, the location of hotspots at the surface with these observed provinces at depth. And uh, uh, Quentin identified in 1998 that, uh, and he pointed out that he identified the location, uh, that hotspot locations tend to overlie these ultra-low uh, velocity provinces in the deep mantle. And then there's uh, follow-up work in 2004, um, and what's, what's, what's key about this is that if these large little shear wave velocity provinces are anchoring plumes in the deep mantle, then you expect hot spots resulting from these upwelling plumes to then overlie the provinces. Now we we know that not all hot spots are generated by plumes, and we have a couple of plume catalog, a few plume catalogs now. I, I think a great project would be to separate the plumes out be, among plumes that uh, uh, separate out the different hot spots, hot spots that are plume fed and hot spots that are not plume fed, and see if the plume fed hot spots tend to overlie the provinces and see if the non plume hot spots are more randomly distributed. Okay, so I believe that uh, these two approaches uh, looked at all hotspots. All hotspots are created equal, but I think we know now that not all hotspots are fed by mantle plumes. We'll get to this in just a second. So this is the 45th anniversary of an important hypothesis that these uh, linear age progressive chains that we see at the Earth's surface are fed by buoyantly upwelling mantle plumes. Uh, it's, it's a really uh, beautiful and simple hypothesis uh, that you have a laterally moving plate that is 
moving at a higher velocity laterally than the plumes tend to blow laterally in the mantle, so you end up with reasonably uh, linear, age-progressive volcanoes. Hawaii is probably the best example where you have young active volcanism in this direction. Pacific plates moving in this direction, at least for the last 47 million years, and volcanoes tend to get older as you move to the northwest. So it's a really simple model. It's appealing, but it's been very difficult to test because plumes have been difficult to image seismically. Um, there have been some controversial results over the last uh, decade uh, where various groups have claimed to see mantle plumes, and it's, these claims have been met with... Uh, uh, various degrees of skepticism or acceptance. Uh, and then a paper came out last year, uh, French and Romanowitz, uh, that showed uh, some of the clearest images of upwelling mantle plumes yet. And here's some nice uh, profiles of the mantle from uh, this, this model, the French and Romanowitz, published in Nature in 2015, uh, showing what uh, what really are uh, uh, um, uh, clear, uh, low-velocity regions, which you'd expect from warmer mantle, low-velocity regions beneath hotspots. Now, a number of important questions emerge from this paper. First, if plumes are purely thermal, then we shouldn't be able to resolve them seismically. They should be too skinny. The observation here that's really important is that the so plumes are really fat. And that means that they must be more than simply thermal anomalies. They must be thermal chemical anomalies. So if they're thermal chemical, what's the chemical aspect of that? What, what is in the plumes that makes them so different from ambient mantle? Do they host a huge amount of recycled basalt? If so, basalt in the deep mantle is quite dense. So plumes have to be even hotter than we thought to buoyantly transport dense basalt to the surface. Another observation is that um, the 28 plume conduits that were observed uh, tend, to, tend to be anchored uh, to one of the two large little shear wave velocity provinces. So is this the case? Uh, apparently, this is controversial, whether or not plumes are anchored to the large lesser wave velocity provinces. Uh, this is an important question we need to address. And something that, that I'm really excited by is if t only 28 of the hot spots have mantle plumes beneath them, that means most hot spots don't have mantle plumes beneath them. And if mantle plumes are sourcing the deep mantle, the large low shear wave velocity provinces, then the hot spots overlying these mantle plumes should be chemically different than hot spots that aren't being fed by the deep mantle. An outstanding question. It'd be an exciting topic to explore. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I make a, just a little bit of comment? I mean, I think it's pushing it a little bit too far, saying that those that we can't see don't have plumes. We can't resolve them. They okay. Great them. point. Yeah, in fact, uh, Barbara, in this paper, you pointed out that there uh, is possibly a plume, for example, underneath Yellowstone, um, but it's uh, hard to see within the resolution of the model. So there may be, there may be purely thermal plumes, for example, that are still um, outside the resolution yeah. of this model. Yeah? Uh, I have a question. Well, so... I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so the, there's this controversy of uh, if plumes are coming from the edges. I don't know if you know, uh, I've always had this question, doesn't um, this <coughs> must have a variation because you're working on an angle and your LSUT is sitting in the core, like maybe when you project up to the surface, that's why they don't seem to come from the edge, but uh, I don't know if you have a, an answer for that. Well, it's worse than that because I Plumes aren't rising vertically in the mantle. So this is one of the observ observations made in this paper is that a lot of the plumes 
rise relatively vertically in the deep mantle, but then in the upper 1,000 kilometers, they tilt over. And this may be because of a large viscosity contrast between the upper and lower mantle. And then this point, um, now here's an example of the, the canary hotspot with the uh, uh, proposed plume beneath it. And yeah, the plume may rise relatively vertically in the deep mantle, but then the hotspot is offset a bit from the plume conduit, and there's a shallow mantle, a low velocity region that's offset from the vertically rising plume conduit. I love, Barbara, how these profiles look an awful lot like the CIDR logo. <coughs> the CIDR logo is at lower resolution. <laughs> <clears throat> so not only do plumes appear to rise and tilt in the modern mantle, but over time it seems that some plumes are probably drifting in what people refer to as the mantle wind. And Jasper is going to talk a bit about this. I hope Jasper is going to talk a bit about this. Uh, so I'm not going to steal too much thunder from uh, Jasper's talk, but it's uh, the idea that perhaps, for example, the Hawaii Emperor trend that shows this bizarre bend at around 50 million years may not be due completely to a change in plate motion, but that the mantle plume conduit itself actually drifted. So this idea of the lateral fixity of plumes isn't really true. Instead, plumes may be drifting about around a bit in the mantle, and we can use this information uh, to map out uh, mantle convection over time by looking to see how hotspot tracks move over time. We can gain a sense for how plumes in the mantle, how their path, pathways were being uh, modified by the mantle wind. So putting together this talk, I came across a paper that Barbara wrote um, in 2008. And it is, this is neat. She, so Barbara argues that the images provided by seismologists are becoming sharper, and so there's an opportunity to work with other geo, geoscientists, geochemists, geodynamicists, and mineral physicists to use our complementary constraints to tackle this inverse problem that the Earth's interior represent. So I'll fall back on my toolkit. I'm sorry, I've tried to limit the number of XY isotope plots. Quentin, I have two. You said I had five, but I think you're counting every axis as a separate plot. <laughs> so so this, this is the toolkit that I have. Okay, and I'd really like to use this toolkit uh, to, to really understand where these diff I want to understand where these different compositions are in the deep mantle. So isotope geochemists love to make these XY plots and label these blurry fields with oh, seemingly nonsensical end members, and can, this all tends to confuse the non-geochemists. Well, the truth is the geochemists are still confused by this. So the dirty secret's out, okay? So here's just a typical plot, uh, lead isotopes versus strontium isotopes, and on the x-axis, right, as you go to really low lead isotopic compositions here, you're in the morb field. As you go to very high radiogenic lead isotope compositions, there's this field that we call high mu, which, since 1982, uh, we've thought that uh, this results from ancient recycled oceanic crust. So oceanic crust has gone down into the mantle. It sat down there for some long period of time. Uh, yeah, the isotopic composition of this crust has been uh, modified, and it's sampled by buoyantly upwelling mantle plumes. Geochemists sample the basalts at hotspots fed by mantle plumes, and they measure these bizarre compositions, like high mu. So, yeah, our best guess is that high mu may represent recycled oceanic crust. It's a very common hypothesis. But then, you, know, you look at these other compositions that you have radiogenic strontium isotopic compositions. We call these EM1 and EM2, depending on you know, whether or not you have moderately radiogenic or unradiogenic lead at relatively high 87, 86 values. And there are debates about what EM1 and EM2 are. I think that they're probably some kind of recycled sediment or continental crust. And this is the standard model. 
which again has been around since uh, 1982 because of these two fellows, Al Hoffman and Bill White. Bill, raise your hand, don't be shy. So blame him for these ideas. So these ideas, they, I like them. They're very simple, they work well. We know that oceanic crust and continental crust, or at least sediment derived from continental crust, has been going into the mantle in large quantities over geologic time. So if this stuff ever comes back up again, the compositions we see in isotopic space are a fairly good match for what we might expect, actually. Now, the big problem is that geochemists, geochemists know what animals are in the zoo. Okay, we have these EM1, EM2, high mu, morb animals, and a bunch of other acronyms too. But we don't know where in the mantle these different species are. Right? On the other hand, seismologists see these provinces in the mantle, regions of higher velocity and lower velocity, but they don't know what these provinces are made out of necessarily. And they can place some constraints on maybe the, the density of these provinces or whether or not there's melt and other things that are simply beyond my understanding still and hopefully I can figure out in the next few weeks. But seismologists don't know where the cages are for these animals. Well, they know where they, the cages are for these animals, but they don't know what animals are in the cage. I think a, a really exciting project that could be a follow-up project to uh, one of the first ciders, which I'll get to just after this, is, is to try to then compare the geochemistry of hotspots that we see at the surface with uh, various seismic observables at depth. And this has been something that geochemists have been working on uh, for over 30 years now. Um, the first real effort uh, was in the early 80s. Um, Prey to Leg had a beautiful paper looking at the global distribution of geochemistry sampled by hotspots. Stan Hart followed up with this. Uh, and each of these points here on this, this global map represents a hotspot that's had, had an isotopic measurement, a strontium isotopic measurement made on the lavas from that hotspot. And he, he contoured this map based on the isotopic composition of the hotspots observed at the surface. And there are a couple of regions, shaded gray, that have particularly high 8786 or particularly enriched strontium isotopic compositions. But as you go far north or far south on the map, the 8786 strontium measured in lavas is lower. And uh, yeah, Stan suggested that you know maybe these bullseyes of enrichment that are near the equator, maybe shifted slightly to the southern hemisphere, tend to correspond with the geoid. And then Pat Castillo came along. Well, it's important to note, 1984 as well. Um, 1984, we had some great observations of these large low shear wave velocity provinces in the deep mantle. Quentin, you were arguing about when exactly these observations were made. Okay, so maybe you're going to question this year. But some important observations were made in the early 80s about uh, specific zones of enrichment in hot spots at the surface and zones of low velocity at depth in the mantle. And four years later, Pacistillo linked the two and noticed that these zones of hotspot enrichment at the surface corresponded with low velocity zones at depth. You know, this is really, this is really important. If the plume hypothesis is true, then you expect material from the lower mantle to be communicated to the surface and expressed in hotspot lavas. And the beautiful thing about this, about this hypothesis is that we can see this with geochemical gradients at the surface. But hotspot lavas overlying these low velocity provinces tend to have a different geochemical composition. Matt, I have a question. Yeah. Seismology cannot really uh, see trace elements. And you're talking yeah. about trace elements. What yeah, exactly. What we really need is the major element composition so that we can. That's right. So, so how do you relate the trace elements to naive seismological? So the bulk question. lithology of materials in the mantle, the bulk lithology, which is uh, major elements are controlling bulk lithology, 
Uh, bulk lithology materials, pritatite versus basalt versus continental crust, uh, also relates to trace element compositions. Continental crust tends to be uh, very uh, silica rich um, compared to the other lithologies, but also very enriched in trace elements. Uh, and then will generate different isotopic compositions. So these different lithologies all have uh, different trace element compositions and different isotopic compositions. Thanks, Barbara. And I think this is a classic example of the power of CIDR collaboration. Uh, this is uh, the first CIDR here at KITP in 2004. Uh, Jasper Conter in the audience was a student, uh, Thorsten, I'm not sure what your status was in 2004, but postdoc. So a postdoc and a student tackled this really big problem, um, trying to relate the composition of hotspots erupted at the surface with geophysical observables at depth. And there's this uh, grid that you can see where they plotted age and EM2, high mu, C affinity versus uh, you name the seismic uh, velocity model at different depths and uh, looked for correlations. And some really neat things fell out. Some neat correlations fell out that still, frankly, we're having a hard time understanding why these things relate. So we might find relationships. It doesn't necessarily mean that we know what these relationships mean. But for example, seismic velocity at 200 kilometers relates to the hotspot's geochemical affinity for this end member that we call EM1, which may be recycled sediment. So this, this is still ripe for exploration, I think. It would be an exciting project to pursue in weeks three and four. And for me, I'm very close to the end here, don't worry. Uh, for me, I think uh, the last four years have been an extremely exciting time in geochemistry. Uh, there have been a couple of discoveries where, uh, first by Sujoy Mukhopadhyay in 2012, and then uh, Hanukkah Rizzo uh, just this year, showing isotopic variability in the products of short-lived nuclides isotopic variability in the modern mantle. So first, 129-130 xenon. 129 xenon is the decay product of 129 iodine. A half-life is about 16 million years. After about five half-lives, the system 129 iodine is effectively extinct. So you're only generating 129 xenon uh, variability in the first 90 to 100 million years or so of Earth's history. And the fact that we observe 129, 130 xenon variability in the isolate mantle source and the morb source today tells us that variability generated in the first 100 million years of Earth's history has been preserved through 4.5 billion years of mantle convection. And when I saw this, it blew my mind. Now, an even Supernova, yeah. Yeah, I was just asking what the, is this on? Yeah, well, what the ultimate origin of the 129 iodine is, nucleosynthetically speaking. I can't tell you if it's RS or P. I can't tell you, but yeah, I mean. Is it supernova or is it a dying star? star? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then 182 half dm decays, 182 tungsten. Half-life is even shorter, about 9 million years. Within five half-lives, or less than 50 million years, 182 half dm was gone. So all the 182 tungsten variability was generated in the first 50 million years of Earth's history, before the giant impact that made the moon. So the fact that we observe variability in 182 tungsten in lavas that are relatively young, Baffin Island, right, is very different from the modern terrestrial standard, MORB, and uh, Hawaiian uh, BHVO basalt from uh, Kilauea. The fact that we observe variability in relatively young lavas, Baffin Island is only 62 million years old, which is a blink of an eye over the age of the Earth, tells us that heterogeneities generated before the giant impact that made the moon 
survived in the mantle, probably attenuated, through the giant impact, and then four and a half billion years of additional mantle convection, mixing, and stirring. So this blows my mind. How do these heterogeneities survive in the mantle for four and a half billion years? I think that there are two sort of end member hypotheses that are emerging. One, I think, uh, is, is uh, received far more attention, and it's the idea that these uh, large low shear wave velocity provinces, or maybe even the ultra low velocity provinces within the large low shear wave velocity provinces, uh, are stable over very long time periods. Maybe not fixed to the mantle, but maybe moving around the mantle, but are still stable. They're, they're perhaps denser uh, and uh, preserve heterogeneities uh, from the Earth's earliest history. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case or not. The other possibility uh, which emerged from uh, Brandenburg, a student of Peter Van Kecken, his work in 2008, uh, looking at a, uh, a global uh, numerical geodynamic model of the Earth's mantle, uh, suggested that up to 20% of the Earth's mantle never makes it above about 150 kilometers depth, and so therefore never melts over the age of the Earth, and so remains relatively pristine and untouched over this time period. And these pristine regions of the mantle are sort of scattered throughout the mantle. And these regions, perhaps, might record the memories of the earliest Earth. So either we have very localized preservation of early Earth isotopic signatures within the large low shear wave velocity provinces, or these early Earth heterogeneities are scattered throughout the Earth's mantle in regions that have remained uh, relatively pristine. So how are these heterogeneities preserved for four and a half billion years, and where are they preserved? Ultimately, this boils down to how the mantle mixes, which is really a question of mantle convection. Right, you can think of uh, heterogeneities in the mantle being stretched and thinned, uh, perhaps down to length scales where diffusion will operate. And we'll have uh, a tutorial, or actually we'll have a lecture uh, devoted entirely to mantle mixing. And finally, this ongoing debate about the composition of the Earth. This debate was triggered in 2005 when this, yeah, I'm not sure. Who took this photo? I, I stole this out right from Bill's slide. This is too good not to show it again. Well, this debate was triggered by the observation that the 142, 144 neodymium of the Earth's mantle and chondrites are different. And, you know, 142 need, when people hear about neodymium isotopes, they're usually thinking about 143 neodymium, not 142 neodymium. 143 neodymium is the byproduct of 147 samarium decay, alpha decay, about a half a billion year half life. But 142 neodymium is a byproduct of 146 samarium decay. The half life is somewhere between 68 million and 100 million years. Look, half-lives are constant. Doesn't necessarily mean we know what they are. Okay, so um, the fact that the 142 neodymium, 144 neodymium between Earth and chondrites was different, it seemed to break the long-held assumption that refractory lithophile elements, so elements that are not volatile and that prefer to be in the silicate Earth, not sulfides or the core, that the ratios of these kinds of elements, samarium and neodymium, are both refractory and lithophile, they should be the same in bulk silicate earth and chondrites. And the fact that chondrites and bulk silicate earth have different 142, 144, seem to tell us that the samarium and neodymium ratio of the two chondrites and bulk silicate earth may be different. Well, okay, total disclosure. Uh, at LPSC, there were a couple of abstracts that showed that maybe this difference in 142 and neodymium between earth and chondrites. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so yeah, pardon. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe simply nucleosynthetic. And the whole point of this, all you need to know is that 
that means that 142, 144, is, as much as it pains me to say, may have, uh, may not indicate that the samarium neodymium uh, ratios of earth and chondrites are different. So the earth may still be chondritic. But, but, we went down this path for a decade and we realized that a non-chondritic earth model works really well. We came up with all sorts of mechanisms for generating a non-chondritic earth, including uh, uh, a collisional erosion of early enriched crust from the planet, leaving behind a depleted planet. And these models for the earth seem to work really well. In fact, I would argue better than models for the earth that depended on the earth being chondritic. And so while our initial rationale for exploring a non-chondritic earth composition may have been wrong, I think we stumbled into territory that's worth exploring still. And Bill is nodding with vigorous agreement, and the other Bill will probably be watching this online, and I'm going to get an email. Anyway, it's exciting times. I'm not going to talk about the core. Quentin's going to touch on this. And of course, the quiz, I promise, at the end. Quentin, tongue in cheek, suggested, so get out your eye clickers. Which one of these is not a Mantle M member? <laughs> Blame this on Quentin, he did this. Raise your hand if Jaime is not a Mantle M member. Hey, you're a geochemist. How about EM0? Raise your hand if that's not a Mantle M member. EM1? EM2. That's okay. <laughs> is Fozo a Mantle M member? <laughs> Emo is not a Mantle M member. Okay, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Quentin, for that. Oh. Maybe I should leave this in in case there are questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, back to the mantle plumes. So you talked about how fat they are, and that must mean that there's a compositional, um, some compositional difference. But then you invoked the idea of a compositionally more dense material basalt and said, oh, so therefore the plumes have to be that much yeah, hotter. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering if the... Um, possibility of a less dense compositionally plume has been ruled out? And if so, what's the evidence to rule it out? Well, and if not, why isn't that more likely? So I've been going and running around with Thorson. Okay, you raised your hand. I'll let Thorson speak, speak about this then. <laughs> Convenient, that. I don't think this speaks to everything that Abby was referring to, but it's sort of, it's just easier to keep things down if they're denser, right? So. A lot of the uh, the argument, well, the argument around the compositional component of these thermochemical piles is based on the fact that they appear to have a non-thermal seismological signature, observationally and dynamically. If you have something that's denser, it's just easier to maintain a reservoir, just like for old continents, right? It helps if they're compositionally lighter to keep them at the surface, so the same thing. So the buoyancy number, the ratio of a compositional density component to a thermal density component is key for the preservation. So there's an observational aspect in terms of, you know, these piles, and then there's a preservation aspect. And then viscosity also plays into it. So I thought we were talking about plumes, not piles. Well, so <coughs> the plume... Uh, argument is mainly based on observations. Then if you entrain this compositional component, it's dense, you're going to end up with different fluid dynamics making fatter plumes. So a thermal plume is one end member. One that has a lot of this dense stuff is the other end member. So it's coupled to the entrainment problem. A lot of the materials that we think are a lot of the materials that we commonly think of being in the deep mantle that are entrained by plumes are denser than ambient mantle. So the large little shear wave velocity provinces are argued to be in bulk denser than ambient mantle. Um, uh, recycled or subducted mafic material, right, should be a few percent denser than ambient mantle. So the, the chemical part of thermochemical 
uh, should be denser than ambient mantle, given, I mean, yeah, what we think is being entrained by plumes. And what we observe in hotspot lavas that are melts of these plumes, we see these signatures that we associate with uh, ancient subducted crust. Yeah, it, it seems to me that a, a really, really critical aspect here, and plenty of people have said this for a long time, is the viscosity variation with depth, and specifically, <clears throat> you know, that, that bottom thousand kilometers. Um, are, will we be able to address this? Are there people that will be talking about that? I mean, if it's, you know, is it, is it a factor 100? Well, I don't see Max Rudolph here, but he just wrote a really neat paper. Max will be giving a seminar um, next week. Hoping that he will be giving a seminar. <laughs> Thank you. So. Yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah, people are going to. Be yeah, because I mean the, the you know mixing rates are really strongly dependent on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <coughs> yeah. And if there's no mixing, then it really changes the picture quite a bit. That's right. <coughs> as far as preservation of these, you know, very ancient uh, geochemical knowledge. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uli, you had a question. Going back to the idea that these um, upwelling plumes are fatter than they're expected purely on thermal grounds, if you look at these images, I think the downgoing slabs are also thicker than expected, right? So, and the slabs, we can calculate pretty exactly how thick they should be based on, you know, conductive cooling or, or uh, diffusion of heat. So is is that something that can be reconciled? I mean, the slabs, the thickness of the slabs, both upper and lower mantle. Uh, the slabs in the in the upper mantle they appear thicker because they, they spread right at the six seven six sixty and thousand kilometers. So um, I think. The, they're not that much thicker. What you see beneath is still a question, you know, how, how it is exactly related to, to slabs and how long it took for that stuff to, to, be, uh, uh, to be the thick as, as we see it. I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily relate it directly. Um, I wanted to come back. I wanted to come back to Abby's um, comment about a, a top-down versus bottom-up, and I wanted to just suggest that we think about how um, deformation, well, how flow in the upper mantle driven by plates might be at a shorter time scale process compared to what's happening in the lower mantle and upwelling being at a at a longer-term process. So, thinking about there being sort of these end members of top-down versus bottom-up may not really make sense, but you may want to think about one process being very controlling what we see at a short time scale, whereas the other process is controlling what we see at a longer time scale, so that it's it's not so cut and dry. Sure. Right? And I'll try to come back and address some things about subduction and, and the what we see in tomography versus what we see in dynamics when I give my lecture on subduction dynamics. Thank you, Megley. And please, you, students, yeah, you please said ask questions yeah, as actually, well. Actually, I just want to um, follow up. I think this is a little bit of the answer to Uli, is that what we see in the lower mantle, maybe on different time scales, than what we see in the upper mantle. Can you talk Great. I have one, one comment. I'm sorry. Before this date of 1984 sticks to, you know, color relations between the large, well, the large scale features at the lower mantle that seems by some by seismic tomography and geochemistry or the geoid. In fact, there's a paper in 1977, I just checked, by Dvoinsky, Hager, and O'Connell, which was at first to correlate the degree two, which is the longest wavelength seismic structure, to the geoid. So it's 1977.
Great. I'm up next, and I'm really thrilled that um, Matt took a long time, because I anticipated he would take a long time. So I've been busily taking slides out of my presentation as, as he's been going on, which is terrific. So at first, I was really daunted by the topic here, because you know, flow in the earth, oh my god. Well, there's two things that concerned me. One was, a few years back, as Barbara alluded to, they changed the name of CIDR from deep to dynamic. And I thought, oh, geez, the dynamicists have taken over. Oh, no. And then I looked at the organizing committee, and it actually only had Michael Manga on it as a dynamicist. So that, that set my mind a little at ease, although Michael's very compelling. Um, and then I thought, well, actually, this is a great theme. Because you know, first off, there's lots of great cartoons that involve flow in the earth. And basically, everything flows. I would argue that the lithosphere flows. Everything flows. So it encompasses absolutely everything on the planet. That's kind of all-encompassing, it, and it spans from you know, geodynamics, obviously, seismology at imaging, heterogeneities at depth, uh, mineral physics at actually understanding compositions at depth, and geochemistry, as Matt correctly described, worrying about reservoirs or uh, the animals in the cages. Now, the other thing about the, uh, that's remarkably great about this topic is that in terms of viscosity, and Frank alluded to this minute ago, you know, there's sort of an average viscosity model for the planet. Uh, and this is just the mantle. If I were to draw the whole thing, the outer core would be 20 orders of magnitude to the left on here. And then you would come back 10 orders of magnitude for the inner core, give or take a little bit. So we have an extraordinarily viscosity stratified planet. And we also have, in terms of the decept, I mean, Prem is, for example, in the seismic domain, it's a nice 1D seismic profile. It has a few percent deviations from it here and there. But in viscosity, the prospects are that we can have orders of magnitude variations uh, in viscosity in different localized regions of depth. <clears throat> the other really excellent thing about this topic is that flow spans so many link scales. So we've got uh, what must be the true picture of mantle convection at the top because it's in cartoon form, um, basically having aspect ratio of, let's call, call it 3,000 kilometers, 6,000 kilometers, something like that. And you can get flow that looks just the same, inferred flow on the kilometer scale within the planet. This is the Skerrigard intrusion from Neil Irvine. And the point I want to make here is that, and one of the emphases of the talk that I'm going to give, is that this, the topic of flow in the Earth is Catholic, that it includes so many things because it includes all the disciplines, it includes all the length scales as well. This is a flow field that spans over a kilometer or two. Planet possibly spans over thousands of uh, kilometers. The problems that arise, and some of these were alluded to in the previous talk, um, the, ex the sort of where things become messy, which is where things become most interesting, is when you have things like mixing between materials with contrast and viscosity and phase, just like you said right before uh, this. The other aspect is when you couple flow and chemistry. And I'm going to give a couple of maybe pathological examples of each of these things as I run through this talk. And lastly, if you have situations where convective and conductive heat flow are very close to one another, you can get some interesting outcomes for the planet. So I'm going to focus on, top, on problems that look like that. But first, let's take a little step back and just recall things that drive material flow. After this, after the break, Michael will give a presentation on uh, thermal convection. And I just want to make the point that, of course, there is that usually in a dynamic discussion, thermal convection often dominates the discussion. And that's appropriate because thermal expansion, which is shown here, in thermal expansion is a function of temperature for a representative oxide, goes up with temperature, goes down with pressure, um, is one of the primary drivers that's employed. But there are others. Heavier element enrichment is an obvious one. You enrich in iron, maybe in the lower mantle. If you enrich in silicon, you can send things downward. And conversely, if you deplete in those elements, you can send things upward. There's also the, the very poorly constrained volume changes on melting as well. That can be positive or negative. So melts could prospectively, because of their volume of melting, go up, or they could go down, depending on where you're sitting in the planet. So, but I, I do want to make sure that at this uh, cider, we don't and confine ourselves entirely to thermal effects on flow. Other things, of course, drive flow. 
externally imposed stresses, of which the most well known in the earth sciences is of course glacial, um, uh, glacial rebound phenomena, obviously drives flow. That's a, that's a separate topic. I, I suspect it won't be too prevalent at this. But there are other things also that can drive flow. Surface energies can drive flow. Variations in chemical potential can drive flow. They've been invoked as, as a pathway for putting uh, platinum group elements into the deep mantle. And I'll give just one quick example of where these things might drive flow. Recent paper by uh, Holtzman. He basically said, well, if I look at the distribution of partial melt as a function of depth, if I look at the wetting characteristics of those liquids, if I want to minimize surface energy, I would actually uniformly distribute those liquids as a function of depth. And that's a dramatically different picture from the distribution of melt that you would get if you reached gravitational stability. The melts would rise out of the system. So this is an instance where it's proposed that the surface energy of the system actually traps melts at depth. And there's a pretty profound implication there, is that you could have unextractable melts at depth driven by surface effects. Maybe true, maybe not, I don't know. But one thing that you can do with this is say, if you have a seismic lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, then you can pers prospectively get a substantial uh, velocity decrement associated with the onset of uh, small degrees of partial melting at those depths, partial melting that you will never see at the surface. Okay, so in lieu of the approach of giving a laundry list of every topic which uh, Matt alluded to uh, that could possibly be probed in conjunction with flow at depth. I picked out three examples of interplays between flow and other disciplines within the earth sciences. And they might be pathological, I'm not really sure. Um, but I'm giving the talk so I get to pick them. Um, the first topic I'm going to talk about is core evolution. And there's a particularly interesting aspect that's, that has, um, seems to be the biggest ticket right now to science or nature papers uh, in the earth sciences, which is that they, uh, or in the deep earth, which is that the heat flow from conductive effects within the outer core may be very close to that that is moved conductively. Oh, that's kind of odd. And of course, our standard picture of the core, which uh, is solid inner core, liquid outer core, it's a very nice static picture, except for the flow lines that generate the magnetic field. Well, so what are the issues here? Well, if I go back to the 1990s, <clears throat> the total heat flow across the CMB, well, it was probably four or six um, uh, times 10 to the 12th watts, give or take a little bit. There's a paper from Bruce Buffett. It's inner core radius as a function of time. So inner core starts growing here. And uh, then it, the arrow marks its current radius. And if you go across, you get something for various values of heat flow between uh, 1.5 and 2.5 or 3 billion years, something like that, depending on what you pick for the heat, <coughs> depending on your favorite heat flow. Now, of course, the issue that that raises, and it's a complex issue, is that if we look at ancient samples, uh, going back 3.6, arguably at this stage, maybe even to 4.0 billion years. This is a field strength versus billions of years for uh, sequence, sequences of samples, <clears throat> done mostly by John Tarduno and his group. You find that basically the magnetic field <clears throat> is loosely, you know, of similar magnitude uh, in the way back compared to the present. Now, the problem comes in here is that you can already detect there might even be a little problem here is that does, do magnetic fields require an inner core? Well, apparently they may not if you actually have magnetism back here, because even in a scenario of the 1990s, it was, uh, you, it was difficult to get an inner core pre-3-ish billion years ago. But a lot has changed since then. And that speaks to the interactivity between these different fields. What's changed? Well, first off, core temperatures got a lot hotter. There's three generations of studies on here, and there's been some more work, including by uh, Jennifer Jackson, since this was done. This is the melting curve of iron, temperature on the y-axis, pressure on the x-axis. I'd say the first generation is labeled with Gen 1. That was in the uh, late 80s, mid 80s. 
uh, generation two was in the early 90s. A lot of people bought into that one. It actually turned out to be almost certainly wrong. Um, it actually turned out to be that uh, where iron underwent fast crystal recrystallization rather than melting. Big difference between that and melting, actually, as it turns out. And then generation three is from, uh, done by Anzalini and company, which is the solid line, uh, solid dark line right there uh, that goes up like this. Now, if you just look at this, if you look at generation two versus generation three, if you extrapolate that to inner core boundary um, pressures at 330 GPA, you get big differences. Basically, you extrapolate the little blue curve there, you get something like 4,400 K for the temperature at the core mantle or at the inner core outer core boundary. If you extrapolate um, the generation three results, you get. Ah, thank you. Question in the middle. Oh, just use the button in the middle. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, then you wind up with a temperature north of 6,000 Kelvin. Ooh, 2,000 K difference. That's not trivial. Also, the other thing that's actually really important for the geodynamo is that the slope of the melting curves are markedly different as well. That actually turns out to be an, import, an important indicator of the power source of the geodynamo. So suddenly, um, People bought, have bought into much higher core temperatures. And that, in turn, implies that there must be higher heat flow out the top. Hmm. Heat flow going up. And this is a very nice illustration from Peter Olson. What yeah. effect, roughly, would compositions other than pure iron? Uh, I will get back to that. But uh, just the brief answer is that sort of from melting curve relations, Generally, a thousand K depression is not a bad depression, and it, doesn't, and it changes a little bit depending on what your initial melting temperature is. But, um, but of order a thousand K, with one exception, and I'll cover that exception a little bit. Okay. All right. So this very nice uh, figure by that was recently came out from Peter Olson is basically sort of the, the um, we'll call it the temperature evolution of the core through time, where. Uh, this is the temperature profile at inner core nucleation. This red dotted line is the melting curve. And at inner core nucleation, the temperature in the core, which follows an adiabat, intersects the, uh, the center of the Earth, uh, the melting curve at the center of the Earth. Now, all of our geomagnetic field through history is essentially driven by the heat content associated with the difference between this dotted line and that line plus the uh, enthalpy of fusion or enthalpy of crystallization associated with the inner core. It's really quite a spectacular thing that three billion years of magnetic field reside in this zone right here. Okay, this also gives light element uh, concentrations with inner core forming with some lower lighter ele element concentration and the outer core actually having its outer core, um, out its light element concentration going up through time. Now there's also something else that happened. Because in the domain of mineral physicists playing tricks on people, the other thing that happened over the last decade is thermal conductivity went up by a factor of two to three. Oof. Or maybe it went up by a factor of two to three. So this is from uh, Pazzo, Gubbins, Alfe uh, a few years back. And this is for first principles theory. This is the thermal conductivity versus pressure at three different, uh, along three different possible adiabats for the core, starting at rooted at 4,000, 4,200, and something like 4,600. And they wound up with a value of something like 150 watts per meters per K for um, uh, core mantle boundary, therm for thermal conductivity of core liquid at um, the core mantle boundary. Uh, okay, that means nothing, me saying 150. The dilemma is that the canonical number is more like 40. That was the widely inferred number. So suddenly the core conductivity went way up as well. And the implications of that are momentous, just momentous. You get heat transport, much larger heat transport in and out of the core. The power you have to run of the geodynamo is a lot less because a lot of the heat is being conducted down the adiabat rather than convected along the adiabat. So that's a very, very dramatic change. So you, you have to basically move all this heat out and still run the dynamo. The other implication is that the inner core forms late. And you might need stable stratification or not at the top of the outer core. OK, 
Okay, what are we talking about in terms of nucleation of, of under core conditions? When does the inner core grow under scenarios with this high thermal conductivity? Well, here's a, a, a standard example of, of a thermal evolution model for the inner core done by Francis Nimmo. This is time. You have entropy production over here, which is a measure of, of, uh, of energy around to drive the field. And over here, you have the inner core radius. And shown here is that you chug along through Earth history, you have uh, results here with both no potassium in the outer core and then about as much potassium as people would really want to put down there. Chug along through Earth history, the black line is the inner core radius, and something like at 4,100, 4.1 billion years into Earth history, 4.15 billion years into Earth history, you start growing an inner core. Okay. I uh, heard Peter Olson give a talk on this last week, and he made the, he made the highly provocative statement, which I'm going to steal, uh, that this means that the inner, if correct, this means the inner core came around after trilobites did, which I think I'm, I'm going to steal that regularly. Um, okay. And the present day core mantle boundary heat flow, if you look at a whole sequence of models, and these involve things like the pre inner core entropy production, how, how basically it was flowing before um, you nucleated the inner core, um, you get a wide range of possible models, but you really can't get out of the range where the inner core doesn't isn't forming somewhere between 1.7 at the very outside, but mostly in the sort of 0.4 to 0.7 giga annum range, depending on your, your favorite choice of parameters here. All right, where did this heat flow come from, or this heat thermal conductivity come from? The thermal conductivity, and this is, this is the dirty underpinnings of this entire story. Um, and there's actually been, were two nature papers back to back about three weeks ago on this. So I want to, I want to convey what exactly is going on with these papers. So there's a venerable rule called the Wiedemann Franz law. I'm not going to expect you to necessarily remember it, but it actually turns out to be critically important in this, which basically says that, um, thermal conductivity is inversely proportional to electrical resistivity, or it is proportional to con electrical conductivity. Why does this make sense? Because electrons are the dominant carrier of heat within liquid metals at high temperatures and pressures. So it kind of makes some physical sense. It's not crazy. So Otani's group, Oda et al., did a sequence of electrical resistivity measurements on iron at high temperatures, and they got values that look like this. I'm not going to belabor too much what this line is right here. It has to do with saturation resistivity, and that's, that's more detail than you need for the moment. What you'd need to know is that they get a value for the uh, thermal conductivity of something like 90 watts per meter per K. And the trajectory that you would infer that they should get is more like 40 watts. It would be up here if it were 40 watts per meter per K, or the old inner core model. Back to back, since nature likes to do this kind of thing, was a uh, paper which came to exactly the opposite conclusion, precisely the opposite conclusion. And it's a rather different experiment. It's basically, this is a cross section through a diamond anvil cell. So there's a diamond here, a diamond here. There's a layer of iron here suspended in argon with a gasket surrounding it. These are temperature contours. And the one thing I would point out is that this, this is really a very challenging experiment done by Konopkova et al. The length scale here, the length scale here is a little under two microns. It's a really tiny experiment. And the length scale on this axis, 0.4 microns, 400 nanometers. So what they're doing here is they shoot lasers in from both sides, heat up the sample so it is statically held at high temperature, and then they stick in a pulse from the other side. And this is what the, this bottom figure shows here, is the temperature, you're, you've got two sides, you're coming along here, you pulse the sample, and the temperature jumps on the pulsed side. But the time lag between this point and this point is a measure of the thermal conductivity. That's the time it took the pulse to propagate through the sample. Okay? So this is actually a direct measurement of thermal conductivity, although really, really hard. So what they got, I've bracketed where the Oda et al. results would lie, somewhere between when all things are considered for temperature and pressure and so forth, they, they run between 90 and 120 loosely, and those would really imply the young inner core model. 
the sort of direct thermal conductivity measurements are markedly different, dramatically different. You have a question? A, qu a quick question. Yes. So as the sample size gets small, the surface effect may come important and play a role, right? Yeah. Well, so you, do, yeah, you do worry a lot about what the optical depth of a metal is under laser excitation. And it actually turns out to be really very thin. So arguably, you're still hopefully, hopefully, sampling the macroscope or the, the bulk properties of the metal as opposed to a surface phenomena. Keep your fingers crossed. Uh, I'm not going to say that that's absolutely true, but that is, uh, that is the net take on things. That iron is not very transparent to infrared radiation, as it turns out. OK, so this is a problem. Now. The reason I pick this particular example is that this is really a domain for creative interdisciplinary ideas. You know, there, the possible solutions to this, <clears throat> maybe it's, maybe this inner core thing, maybe it's all overrated. That's possible. Uh, maybe really it's really easy to run a geodynamo without an inner core, and we don't really understand how a dynamo runs without an inner core. That's a possibility. Maybe we don't understand the boundary conditions at the top of the core or the base of the mantle. That is, the heat flow might be different than we think. Like, for example, it's been sporadically suggested that you might enrich the base of the mantle in radiogenic elements, which would provide a hot layer at the top and reduce the heat flow out of the core. Geochemists complain about this very often. But the question is, do geochemists complain enough that where they're screaming or just squealing quietly? And if they're only squealing quietly, then it's probably plausible. Then it's more than plausible. It's probably right. So th there is that possibility as well. The other solution, which I've al I alluded to earlier, is maybe th we've got the temperature of the outer core wrong. That's possible. Maybe if you put in hydrogen. Hydrogen is a really good antifreeze, as it turns out. It's a very good antifreeze for the core. Uh, and it could drop the temperature very substantially. Planetary scientists, accretionary people get very upset at this notion because it's very hard to retain hydrogen as you accrete the planet and especially to retain it within the core. It's not an easy solution. It involves a lot of special pleading. Nevertheless, it is something that's coming out of Japan. Then, you know, sort of the way I look at CIDR in terms of the research projects that have been successful, I'll just editorialize on this for a second, is they fall in two categories. One is sort of fairly low-hanging fruit in the interdisciplinary domain. Compare a, compare a seismically derived geotherm for the upper mantle to a pet petrologically derived geotherm. That's a pretty, you know, that's, that's low hanging fruit perhaps. But the other is if you have a really creative idea. And this is the domain of, and a really creative idea can actually make something work in a few week time frame. Whether it's melts descending and making layers at the bottom of the mantle, uh, like Sinti Lee did, or um, <clears throat> as we'll talk about in a little bit, some different composition for LLSVPs, you can do fairly creative things. And that's where this unrecognized energy source in the outer core. Maybe there's something, people have thought about radiogenic sources in the outer core for a very long time. But one proposal, again, this is good for nature again, uh, exolution of other components. O'Rourke and Stevenson basically said, all right, if we form the core at very, very, very high temperatures during the accretionary process, Lots of things become soluble and stuff at very, very, very high temperatures. So let's make magnesium soluble in the outer core at a very low level. And then, as you cool it down, have it exolve. And then <clears throat> you have this delightful figure from Bruce Buffett's News and Views on this, where uh, magnesium combines with oxygen, strips out, makes a bunch of MGO or something like it at the bottom of the mantle. And uh, this stuff is compositionally denser, starts descending, and you can drive a dynamo that way. Right? I don't know. My suspicion? No. But uh, it's very creative. <laughs> and of course, it got published in Nature. The last possibility is that maybe the thermal conductivity of the core really isn't that high. Maybe the Konakopova stuff is right. And there's less of a problem here. It's kind of a minority opinion at the moment, because, uh, but it might be right, uh, that because both theory and a range of experiments um, seem to favor somewhat higher values. But there are data that are direct that favor a lower value. Key point I want to make here is that for CIDR, this is a domain where creative interdisciplinary ideas can get traction. That's what, why I picked this particular pathological example. 
All right. I do want to talk a little bit about LLS VPs. I somehow doubt I'll get to hydration of the mantle, but that's okay. The, I'll talk about LLS VPs from a little bit more of a compositional perspective. And then I want to just look at some of the dynamic pictures and their implications. And basically what I'll conclude is there's no story yet. And that means there's an opportunity because I don't think we actually really have a coherent picture yet. So a bunch of different origins of LSVPs have been proposed. There's primordial X, which is the most common geodynamic solution. You put something that has 3% dense, that's 3% denser at the bottom of the mantle and stir it around for a while. That I would say, whatever that is, whatever 3% denser is, is primordial X. Uh, Tromper and others have proposed that if you look at the seismic velocities, which you know are not, I'd have to say, not the best constrained for the interiors of these bodies, you might, and there's a direct trade-off with temperature, that the possibility is that they could be, if they aren't too hot, enriched in both iron and silicon, but if they're really hot, they could be morb too, which basically opens the entire compositional domain of the mantle for what they could be. So. Uh, effectively, the temperature of these things ultimately has a direct feedback betw between the major element to the major element concentration. Then we have a, the subducted morb, and I'm very explicit here that it is morb, a uh, graveyard down there that somehow or other morb sits there and stays there. A while ago, I think it was Thorne, Ed, and I proposed low fraction of silicate melt in this zone. We got ignored. Um, probably okay. Um, low fraction iron alloy melt. Uh, Michael will talk about that on Friday. That's a cider result that just came out. Um, and then the question is, is what is the temperature as well? So the observations are really very simple. It's at the bottom, pretty much. Uh, might be underlain by ULVZs in a few places. Low seismic shear velocity, minus 2 to minus 3.5%. Maybe elevated density. This is a number we should know better, I would hope, at some stage in the future. But it, folks have said roughly 1% is probably right. right? Sharp edges. And maybe, maybe, as Matt talked about in detail, a general correlation with lips and hot spots. Okay, there's one set of simulations from last year. And again, this is starting with an unspecified 3.5 density anomaly in the bottom most 100 kilometers of, uh, of the mantle, and let it tectonics push it around. It's from Mike Gernis's group, among others. And what you find is that in both compositional and temperature space, you wind up with a fairly complicated picture. You have, um, you have uh, large temperature variations on the inside of this. This is a zoom in of, of that. The arrows represent 15 centimeters per year of displacement, so these things are moving fast. So you've got basically uh, cooler stuff in here, hot stuff near the edges, which may be an answer, could provide some answer to why the edges might destabilize. And you know, it's not clear that you get sharp edges out of this. It seems like there's a gradient here. And the question here is, can geodynamics really resolve between any differing origins of LLSVPs? And do these things have internal structure? If I look at a separate set of simulations, these are really lurid, uh, by uh, Bernard Steinberger and his group, they come to a, they actually do something a little different. They say, we're going to subduct MORB, and we're going to take it uh, to the bottom of the mantle, and if we lower the viscosity at the bottom of the mantle by a little bit, and that actually isn't a very big viscosity change, we can manage to segregate the oceanic crust and pull it up and mix it with other material. And the mixture of the material winds up being very close to zero buoyancy, and so it sits down there till it gets hot enough that it can uh, come out and be entrained. Now, the advantage of this is that it's renewable, it's entrainable, it's long-lived, mixed with normal mantle, depends on a little bit of low viscosity near this core mantle boundary, you will notice on this that the thermal edges, uh, which the thermal scale is on the left, are actually separate from the compositional edges. And that's something that uh, needs to be, that I would say is, is an interesting observation. And it's unclear how sharp the boundaries really are. And I tried to look very carefully at, at this. Um, yes. So the gamma in that plot, is that the Grunison parameter? Ah, no, it is not. It is the ratio of viscosity in the layer to uh, a reference viscosity model. So this is the a quarter of the viscosity, half the viscosity, three quarters of the viscosity. The, 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 these folks, they haven't heard of the Grunison parameter. It's all good. Okay. And then, 
so my point here is that there's a lot of different simulations out there. It's not clear they're giving a lot of insight into the composition. So with Paul Tackley's group, he puts a 3% dense layer down there. And he gets a little bit of entrainment, but a lot less than, other, than uh, Steinberger does. It's not clear that it's sharp. And he actually finds that it gets hot enough underneath it that it is only that in terms of the transition near the core mantle boundary from the perovskite structure to the post-perovskite structure, it's hot enough underneath it that the uh, anomalous regions are only underlain by perovskite. That's actually seismically testable. And it actually, it may even be uh, seismically falsifiable already because it looks like there are post-perovskite transitions <coughs> that have been observed under the LLSVP, um, under LLSVPs. So what they've done is basically tried to look at if you have different rheologies at the very base here, strong post-perovskites at the top, weak post-perovskites at the bottom, and you actually, I would say, can't tell the difference in anything except for viscosity, and that's one of the uh, things that's imposed at the start. The complaint I would raise about these, being a whiny mineral physicist, is that I suspect they're missing a large portion of the dynamics. And why they're missing a large portion of the dynamics is that at the bottom of the mantle, if I do put a bunch of morb down there, basalt, and I do buy the hot core temperatures that we talked about earlier, bottommost 50 to 100 kilometers, you're going to remelt that basalt. These are current melting, temp, uh, melting curves for basalt. They're actually, in, I would argue, in pretty good agreement, actually, as such things go, uh, from two separate French groups, the group of Androl et al. in blue, and the uh, group uh, associated with Guillaume Fiquet in red. So, the key thing that is that if you're modeling the rheology of, of low, large low velocity provinces, there are a lot of parameters that could be toggled, including extremely low viscosity at their base or within them, that might modulate their behavior. And those have been completely untapped. So my net conclusion on this section is LLV SVPs may be long-lived, or they might not be if they're tapped a little more aggressively. Uh, the dynamic models have a lot of trouble getting sharp edges. They really are uniformly hot, it seems like. Role of basal viscosity is unclear at this moment. And it seems like they can leak and exchange. And how f the key question there in my mind is how fast do they leak and exchange? Do they leak and exchange fast enough that they can be removed over geologic history or not? And that's, that's a more difficult question. Or are, as Steinberger would have it, perpetually regenerated. The net outcome that I would say is that we haven't fully built that bridge between the composition, structure, formation, dynamics, oh yeah, and trace element composition uh, of the uh, LLSVPs. And where there's a lot of uncertainty, where there are places where the picture remains to be determined, that's an area where CIDR can be particularly um, effective, I think. Let's see, I, was, we, I think you wanted me to end very promptly at 10.30, didn't you, Michael? Okay, so I will skip through a wonderful illustration of actually from Laura Montesi's work on, and I'll just show one slide because I like this one slide. If you subduct water within slabs and uh, the water is entrained within the mantle layer as opposed to the, to the surface, uh, as opposed to the crustal layer. You can get some very interesting behavior associated with dewatering, where you spit off water at depth. This is the decomposition of the hydrous phase called phase D. It, its path upward, which would normally be vertical, is advected downward by the flow field associated with the subducting slab, and it winds up hydrating the, um, the transition zone in sort of a triangular region that is basically 2,000 kilometers inboard from the subducting slab. This is an example of, of very regional features that couple flow with chemistry. That I would say that this is an odd and maybe unexpected result that you could get these cylinders parallel to the slab of low viscosity uh, and water enrichment. And I'll close by just saying lots of op cider opportunities. Core evolution, you know, we can look at low conduction or alternate heat sources. 
LLSVPs, there's a really enigmatic role right now, I'd say, of, the, of the, how their composition interacts with their dynamics, and possibly well their relationship with the underlying ultra-low velocity zones that reside either next to them or beneath them. And volatiles in the mid-deep mantle, and I would put carbon in this too, and slabs well, induce heterogeneous viscosities, varying densities, you get rapid transport, and messy chemistry. I think there's a huge area there, just huge, that, ha that has only been scratched minimally. So I'll close it out there. Thank you very much. A quick, quick question on the core. Um, yes. What, what do our neighboring planets tell us about core cooling? Because uh, apparently Venus has no magnetic field. Mars apparently had one. One assumes they've got crystalline cores. What is, how does that all fit in? Well, that's that's a really good question. And. Uh, the issue is, well, I mean, the question would be, uh, one avenue has been to say, well, perhaps Venus has no inner core. Uh, it's hotter, and hence may have a hotter mantle. Its surface, its external boundary temperature is hotter. And so if you up its temperature by a few, by 100K, 200K, maybe you actually have never formed an inner core, which begs the question of, if the inner core is recent, how come we had a field and, they, and it didn't? But the style of heat transport in Venus may be quite different. This may be an example where top-down actually works, where plate tectonics uh, actually forms a continuous mechanism of heat transport out, and Venus you know, might resurface every 500, 600 million years. So the style of heat transport out of Venus may be dramatically different. So in that case, the, the assertion would be that the mantle really modulates the Venusian magnetic field. Mars, I'll just say it's smaller, cooled faster. Don't we have some constraints on when we think the magnetic... Yeah, uh, yeah and it shut off a long time ago. We'll call it the... No if, if I remember right, the Noachian. Yeah, right. Uh, 4.0. Yeah, 4.0, give or take. So it shut off very shortly after it formed. It was on-off. And so the notion that uh, you could have... The other, other wild card in this is you could evolve stable stratification in the core as well. There's a few different mechanisms that you might ev evolve, evolve stable stratification. And if you do that, you're probably done. I think that's uncontroversial. You're done with the magnetic field. Goodbye. So, so reading Nature, um, I almost got whiplash reading these papers back to back. Right. And it, it wasn't only a factor of three difference in conductivity, it's a factor of five difference in the age of the inner core. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's not linear. So at some level, uh, before getting too worked up about the implications of either end member, I was curious, what's going to resolve this? Is this? Is, should we just wait and see? Is it something that's going to succumb to improved experimental measurements? Or is it something that's just uh, always going to be an uncertainty? I think the, well, the answer is that I think if, if you want me to project forward, what will ultimately happen here is that, um, and I'll put up a, another figure here. What will ultimately happen here is that we will move away from electrical conductivity as a measure of thermal conductivity, and that we will have to start measuring thermal conductivity itself right. And whether the Geophysical lab with Konopkopova et al. did that correctly. I'm not going to swear on a stack of Bibles. I agree with your whiplash sentiment. But if we look at what the electrical conductivity scaling with thermal conductivity, uh, I think I would put it that the, down here that the uh, Wiedemann France law between electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity, there's the proportionality there for metals at 300 Kelvin. It's okay as such things go. It's not great. That's a log scale on the left. Uh, no, it's not a log. Yeah, it's a, log, it's a semi log scale on the left. So it is, um, I'd say it's kind of a factor of two kind of thing. That scares me a lot. And, oh, I made this yesterday. Um, if you look, just look at liquid iron at ambient pressure, where we actually know the thermal conductivity pretty well, and the, uh, look at the comparison in electrical conductivity as well, they're off by about 25%, give or take, at the melting temperature. So, you know, I, my line here is that, like, if you remember the movie The Pirate's Code, where there were, uh, or rather the um, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, there's a scene with the Pirate's Code where somebody says, you're not, you can't kill me, it's against the Pirate's Code. And they say, well, Pirate's Code is just guidelines, it's not a law. And I kind of think Wiedemann Franz law may actually be guidelines and not a law. So I would be very worried about that. That's that. So I think measurements of thermal conductivity is the answer. Um, 
I have a question that follows up on that a bit. Um, when, as someone who's gone to CIDR a number of times, one of the things that I learned uh, at CIDR is to talk to experimental mineral physicists and learn a bit about uh, what kinds of factors contribute to uncertainty in results that experimental mineral physicists give us. It's much harder for me to get a sense of what kind of uncertainty I should expect for uh, ab initio or theoretical calculations. I mean, as uh, someone who's, I guess, quite naive in these matters, you know, a factor of two in something where you start at infinity and you end at 50 doesn't seem that bad. Maybe it's 100, maybe it's 25. Should we even, when, when we care about variations that are less than a factor of two, should we worry about these ab initio calculations? That's a really good question. And it's a very subjective question. And it depends on who you ask. And I would say that there is definitely value to ab initio calculations. The question would be that what I would argue is that thermal conductivity directly out of an ab initio calculation is actually really a touchy, touchy, touchy calculation. So do I believe ab initio in pressure volume space and things like that and probably things like the Grunheisen parameter? Yeah, probably not bad. Um, you know, I'll blur my eyes a little and it'll be okay. Um, but I think that the wide-scale validity of these for, uh, is something that needs scrutiny at this juncture. That actually is something that, you know, as boring as it sounds, some mineral physicists ought to sit down and look at every molten material and basically evaluate what we know and to the degree that there are first principles calculations, do a comparison. Because I don't know. <laughs> I have a follow up. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys really want your coffee. Um, just a quick, quick follow up question, which is is the physics understood for that high pressure? <coughs> are, we, are we looking at the Earth doing a fundamental experiment for us? Or do we understand the physics and it's really about trying to get the right measurement? Is there uh, Abby, I don't want to start talking about anelastic scattering of electrons here because I don't know anything about it. But that's the sort of thing that it ultimately hinges on, is things like anelastic scattering of electrons. How well do we predict those? I don't know. I think we do pretty good at charge clouds. I think we do pretty good at bonding. But anelastic effects on electron transport? I don't know. I honestly don't. Yes, you do. Thanks.